Hi, everybody. It's Craig Shoemaker with Enlightened Up, the podcast that hopefully offers some uh, some light to your darkness. And there's a lot of darkness out there. We are the alternative, and we have great guests. And I've been told recently that we're like the inside the actor studio for comedians. But we have other people other than comedians. Today, we happen to have one. And uh, I am so happy to have him here. I'm a longtime fan of his. He probably doesn't know it. Yes, he does. Because I've actually said this on television when you retired. Fritz Coleman is our guest. Now, Fritz, people outside of Los Angeles don't know who the hell I'm talking to right now. <laughs> That's all right. Well, you know, I've got some stuff in the internet. I had a viral video about being old. You did? Yeah, so uh, I... I it got... must have been recent. Because, no, well, yeah, it was. Because you've only weeks. been old for like I, a few days. Oh, no, no. <laughs> if, if only that were true. But I'm so happy to be on with you, man. This yeah. is... You're great at everything you do, and uh, this is just another tentacle. You never of your saw talent. me play sports. <laughs> no, well, that's all right. I, well, once in a while I could do it, but I actually just won our club championship in golf. This is like a Philly support group. Yes, we are both from Philadelphia. I don't think you knew this. I put this in my yearbook. I wanted to be a weatherman. So you talk wow. about envy. This guy has been a weatherman, I believe, for 40, 40 years. years yeah. 40 years on the number one station in California, Los Angeles. Fritz Coleman is like the guy that you watch on the weather. Mm -hmm. And I grew up watching Jim O'Brien, which I'm oh, sure yeah. you remember him. Yeah. I, I listened to him on the radio in WFIL, and then he was the, he was the uh, guy on television, and he talked so fast, but he had such authority. Oh, yeah. We got a weather good guy, weather bad guy. Back to you, Jimbo. Yeah. <laughs> He was amazing, and yeah. I did my college paper. I went to Temple, and I think you went there, too. too. yeah. It's amazing how we, our lives never crossed. Annenberg <laughs> School. Don't ask me any professors, because I worked at Wi-Fi Radio, W-I-F-I. I was oh. a jock at Wi-Fi while I was going to Temple, and I had been in the Navy before that. Yeah. And the reason why I quit at Temple was because I had teachers that didn't have a day of experience in broadcasting, and I, I was on the radio in the fourth largest radio market in the United States, and so I, I looked down on these teachers. I said, you have nothing to say to me. And I got out. I booked. I, I really did. It's the you biggest just did it quietly. Out. You didn't walk up to them and do an intervention <laughs> no, and say, no. you, you need some radio experience. You have no chops. No, it was all theory and stuff, and I just didn't, I, it, it didn't connect. You know me. what? I'm with you on that, and I don't want to tell people not to go to college, but the, no. my experience came from experience, and my no. talents came from no. that. I mean, you, you I wasn't have kids. taught. Yes. What, what they're finally doing in the world now is realizing that you might not be an academic. I wish somebody said to me, you know, maybe a trade school or a wow. skill. My middle child is a, an electrician. He's the happiest person I know. And makes he, more money than he anyone. Does, right. Know. He doesn't want to be behind a desk. Yeah. He's got a great sound. And there's always work. Oh, yeah. Like, like think about that. There's always electricity. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> right? true. It's ne electricity's never going to go away except yeah. for maybe a, a power outage, which that means even more business <laughs> for him. But, but, uh, but, but we, I, I couldn't teach my children that. We always say, well, no, you, you have to go to college. Yeah. And, and I, and, but now they're realizing that not every child works out of that part of his brain. I, I've been hearing this a lot lately. It's funny you should bring yeah. this up. Just yesterday I was, I was listening to someone uh, talk about this. And, and it's true. I mean, so I try to do with my kids. I just try to encourage what drives you, you know, yes. what, what, what you have passion about. Exactly. Now, uh, did you have this happen? No, this is, it drives me crazy. Got an, I didn't have a dad, so I do a lot of making up. You know, like a lot of making up for I what he I knew that. what he didn't give me, like my dad, I give to the children. Oh, so yeah. I overdo we, it. We reparent ourselves. We oh. all do that. Oh. We make up for the mistakes of our parents <laughs> or what was missing. I do that too. Yeah, yeah. But it, you, now my kids are going to end up in therapy going, my father with the I love yous. Uh, <laughs> it's annoying. It became annoying. It's enough already. Uh, oh, he's paying attention to me all the time. I'm like, go away. I'm trying to be alone. Yeah. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> at least my dad wasn't around when I was masturbating at first, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Now I'm interrupting my kids. <laughs> no instruction there. But, yeah. but I had this discussion Sunday night at a dinner. I, I, I said, my father never said, I love you. Yeah. I, 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 I told somebody a, a, a statistic that they found false. They thought I was lying. I never spent over four hours alone with my father in my whole life, I never went to a movie. I never went to a baseball game. I wow. never threw a baseball. And yet you lived with him. I lived with him. And it was not a dysfunctional family. But he was the guy. He was the post-World War II dad said, look, 
Hitler's not in charge of the country. You got three squares a day. You go to a great school. You get a beautiful house in middle America. Shut the hell up. I'm giving you everything I'm giving you. Mm. I, I'm providing for you. Yeah. You know, the emotional stuff, don't bother me with that. Yeah, but... It, it, that, was, a, it was a different time. It, it was a different time. It, but I wonder how much we should borrow from that time as opposed to recreating this new time, which has also created some problems. Yeah, maybe a balance would be better. Exactly. We, and we've yet. created entitlement. Not yeah, a good thing. Absolutely. You know, I was saying the other day, all oh, that's all that stuff that I did. I was talking oh, no. to so I was talking to somebody. Oh. He hadn't seen me in a while, and he goes, oh, "I remember. I went to your son, who's now twenty three. I went to your son's third birthday party, and you had like, <laughs> I had like, I had to have the perfect Luke Skywalker. I, they oh, were sending me photos, and I had to pick the guy that looked the most like Mark Hamill, right. <laughs> because you know, like my son someday, like when he's forty, he's gonna go, my dad. Oh my God, he had this Mark Hamill that I thought was Mark Hamill, who's yeah. do, you know doing the uh, lightsabers with him, and I've got the bouncy house and everything else. These but kids you, don't remember squat from you, that you stuff. You have a reason though. You're you're plugging in what you didn't get from a father. Hundred percent. So you yeah. have a total explanation. I'm reading a great book now called The Enemy from Within, oh. which is written by this guy who's like an instructor at the Navy War College. It says the reason why our country is so screwed up, we're just a big teeming pool of narcissists here. Yeah. We're so spoiled, and we're. He said the problem is. There's relative peace in the world. Forget Afghanistan. I mean, generally, mm. there's global peace in the world. We don't have anything pushing back against us, and we don't know what to do with ourselves. We're so no, spoiled. No, we got to go really start a fight. Yeah, yeah. It's it, and obviously, it's the system that we're under too, because it's it's so funded that they own they own us. They literally own our brains now. Oh, that, yeah. That's why I'm really frustrated. That's why I left the left. Talked to you about that earlier. Yeah, yeah. I left the li left. I was always I've been out of the right for a very long time. And uh, I'm out of both because they're not thinking. There's no critical thinking. They get in line. I'm writing a book called Get Out of Line and Into Alignment. <laughs> That's a Just great title. be in alignment with yourself. Yeah. And ignore that. You know, yeah. ignore this paradigm that they've created through money and power. And yeah. it d doesn't make any sense. There is no pursuit of happiness no, within and this. and none of it works right none now. None of it works. Mm -hmm. That's what people don't step back and go, hey, does that work for you? Mm -mm. Does that work for you to attack others like that? Mm -mm. Is that, does that ever, do you ever go to bed and I had a great day of attacking? I think I got four people, <laughs> four people <laughs> under my attack list. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. No one's making any sense right now. No, that's brilliant. I, I, I find, I'm a centrist. I, I think I'm a social Democrat, and I think I'm a little more conservative on the fiscal side. Yeah. Like, I don't think we ought to go nuts and put our children and grandchildren in debt. But I, I, right. I don't like, you know, first of all, I don't know how you can be a member of the Republican Party now because it's a shadow of its former self. Oh, absolutely. It, yeah. it's, uh, it's an autocratic, uh, uh, hero-worshipping, um, fascist That's, that's what enterprise. I've been saying. I said, I said, how can you deify, you know, and also if you're evangelical, that makes it even worse. Yeah. If you're deifying someone, especially yeah. someone like that, I yeah. don't know what I'm talking about, yeah. that makes no sense whatsoever yeah. i don't know even how you can look at yourself in the mirror and reflect that no, back and go yeah. that's a good idea to let yeah. this person with that track record yeah. of of ill repute yeah. have that be supposedly like a Christian values. These are not Christian values. I, and I love the way the evangelicals try to twist how they think oh, yeah. Trump was put there by God to do their work. Amazing well, you know, King David was flawed and he wrote, you know, I thought, come <laughs> on, man, are you kidding me? This is the least Christian human being that's ever been in the White ever. House. Ever. And he's laughing all the way oh, because yeah. he knows yeah. that he's not. Yeah. I know the guy. I mean, I yeah. know many people that know him. There's not one person no. I've ever, ever talked about him with that knows him that go no. have you heard his verses of the bible that he refers to <laughs> i mean it's unbelievable that's to why me that i loved it when he went across the street and got a picture of himself taken with a bible and the bible was upside upside down. that was classic yeah. but let's be fair before you know more people tune i've actually had people go up i say one little word i said something about pence you know in a debate uh, i'm no longer your fan uh, that's the thing they're canceling on that yeah. i always say if you have such great faith yeah. in whatever you believe in, then why do me, why do I bother you so much to set, to put you off center so much so that you're going to cancel out your favorite comedian so you're now canceling out yeah. tens of thousands of laughs 
just because yeah. you resent and don't understand the joke I told about Mike Pence, who you don't know either. And the key so, word is comedian. You're there yes. to lance the uh, right. That's the, that's uh, self important. Can you believe how they're coming after us? Yeah. It's, it's hard. It's amazing. In a club, to me. it's hard. Oh, when I, I heard Seinfeld say, "I will never <laughs> do," people, yeah, the least defensive the, comic I, ever. Oh my god! Right. He was like yeah. he was manufactured by the ad agency that did McDonald's. Or <laughs> I mean, I love the guy, but they, there's nothing offensive about him. No. And he said, "I won't do a college campus anymore because yeah. you can you can say the the least offensive thing, and they'll boo you right off the stage." It's amazing wow. to me. It's 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 tribalism. How, how are you, how are you doing in, in clubs with that? I'm going to tell you a secret. I shouldn't share this secret because there are other comedians watching, but I will share it for free. Okay, <laughs> Just download me, okay? Give me nice reviews. Spread the word about this podcast, okay? That's all I ask for what I'm about to impart. The secret is, for me, in life period, is only share my experience, not my opinion. That is, no. so if I have, exp like I experienced Donald Trump, so I can form an opinion from that experience and share the experience with you. But just coming from an opinion about something I read, which is usually someone else's opinion, you're not going to hear that from me. So they can't debate on stage if I say, I watched figure skating when I was a kid. My mom made me watch figure skating. And I would notice the guys trying not to flame in the interview, <laughs> right? That's a true story. So yeah. I, I tell that story. I tell whatever story. So they can, you're homophobic. No, it's a child sharing his childlike experience of, I used to watch the, the mixed pairs and the guys in tight tights. And I'm sitting there thinking, how come he doesn't have a boner? Because he's <laughs> lifting up this girl in a miniskirt. I'm going, how does he not have a boner? <laughs> and I used to look at the tight pants on ballet dancers. Why don't they have boners? Because I was getting boners. Now, are you going to be angry with me from my observation of me as a child? Yes, they will, yeah. because they're sensitive to it. They're walking in with the narcissism no. as if we need to hear your groan and your moan and your protests. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, that side of the argument is always in such denial. They don't allow themselves to see the humor. Humor is based on irony. They don't allow themselves to see the irony. They're just stuck in their own yes. opinion. And I left the left, though, because they're now deifying. They're deifying. They yeah. deify Fauci, for instance. Yeah. Deified. Yeah. And they, they'll submit his resume and they'll say, well, he's qualified. He's been to this many administrations. So was Hoover. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And doctors. So was Mengele. Yeah. <laughs> Very qualified. You, you just can't deify people. No, that's a good That's point. what I want to look into the camera and say, don't deify anyone. There's no one, including me. Okay. Just rate me in a good rating. Well, that, that, <laughs> that's what they think um, this is about with Trump. It's the first time in this country where we've ever experienced authoritarianism and being swayed yeah. by a charismatic figure. We've never had that in this country before. Europe has had many of them. They have many fascist course, leaders, yeah. Hitler and, and, you know, Stalin yeah. and all those guys. I've never seen, you know. They've had it. You know how we know the difference? Rallies. I never saw one president ever have a rally no. from the right or left. A and, rally. And if you look yeah. at the older movies about Berlin in the early 30s, all the rhetoric oh, yeah. you're hearing now and Same. all the, you know, the Trump rallies, it's very similar in its vibe. Yeah. And, that, and, and this is our first experience with this. I hope we're able to escape it without falling too far over the cliff. Well, yeah, but again, now the left <laughs> is falling for it. They're falling for the same things they're projecting onto the right. They're doing the same deifying. They're getting in line. It's the same, you know, uh, uh, their censorship. If you have anything that opposes their narrative, there's they, they take they get rid of you. You, I literally am so afraid to talk about anything pandemic because I'm really into research. But research yeah. has got to go beyond what they're showing, put in front of you. Right. Has to right. use your common sense. Right. Just look at the ads; they're all from drug companies. Yeah. So therefore, the people who are telling you the news and choosing the news, they are all dictated by the drug companies and, and other companies. and other big corporations. No, so they true. all are. That's why we got all in on the Iraq War. I was the first one to go. Yeah, I don't think they're coming for us. I don't think there's weapons of mass destruction. Oh, people call me a traitor, and he had eighty percent approval rating. 80% because we were all swayed by television. They mm -hmm. told us that you were not a patriot unless you went along with the flow, with the, what they decided was. What you're saying is the reason why people have been bamboozled by right-wing internet media. They're not doing their own research. And left-wing. Yeah. That's the thing. Is now I mean, I'm off I mean on everybody. I don't mean to be right. I mean everybody. Everybody That's is why. swayed by corporations yeah. 
who have an agenda. They own the lobbies. They own the laws, yeah. Yeah. right? They make the laws. So I'm saying, what I'm saying is right or left, there's no right or left. You got to be somewhere in yourself, in alignment with yourself, and take a look. Take a, Just come, step back and look at what's really, really pulling the strings. It's corporations that want to make a lot of money. Oh, yeah. If you go to war, if there's a war on drugs, <laughs> every single thing. Marijuana is, you know, the history of marijuana. I did a movie about it. I did a movie about it. You know the history of marijuana, why it was banned and, and, and demonized? Corporations. Nobody was making money off DuPont, of it. DuPont, Hearst, they were threatened, to chemical companies, paper companies, and they saw to it that LaGuardia and so forth demonized something that was grown by Thomas Jefferson and smoked by Thomas Jefferson. Our forefathers did it. But I did the deep dive of research when people are just going, no, it's, it's bad, and people were, it was a Schedule One drug, and people were going to prison for it. You know what that did to our population? How many people went to prison for pot? No. And now it's just it's just like the war in, in Iraq and Vietnam. It just there's nobody blamed for it. They yeah. just oh, uh, it's okay. It just That's happened. Really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I, and by the way, speaking of history, I'm gonna take this over to you. I saw a piece you did on history on music. I, it was just it was extraordinary, and I, and and because I'm going to tell you a secret to why it was extraordinary, but, but maybe you don't know. It's what I just said. You shared your experience of growing up in the house, listening to records, and the Philadelphia sound, and what you were brought up with, and that's why you connected with me. It was beautiful. Well, the greatest compliment I got was the day you texted me and said you listened to the whole thing. It's 33 minutes long, and it meant so much to me. I have such respect. There's nobody funnier in America than you, and that really meant a lot. Plus, you, you had the same growth experience as I did in suburban Philadelphia. But that was in the midst of the Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd feel. Yeah. And I just felt like I felt, and really, I didn't expect this thing to get any traction. It got a little traction on Facebook. But I just wanted to, you know, throw my discussion in the ring about what it was like to grow up in a very white, low-grade racist household that were my parents. Uh, but I kind of g helped to get them out of it because I loved African-American music when I was growing up. Yeah. And that's what infiltrated the house. Motown infiltrated the house. <laughs> it was an insurrection by Motown. Yeah. But anyway. I, I, I Believe me, I relate to it. I mean, I was brought yeah. up in a, in a white household, even though I found out I'm part black. But anyway. Oh, wow. 14% Ghana. Anyway. Oh, is that true? Wow. A whole other world. Wow. But, but it doesn't mean anything. You know, it just goes to show no, you. No, but it gave you your soul. That's why you're soulful. No, I mean, I am because of the way I was brought up. And because a woman, is, a woman was in my house, that my mom would go to work, no dad, and a Myrtle, big African-American woman. I mean, big, like... And the way she ate and the way she did everything, the way she, mm -hmm, I mean, just that whole, mm -hmm, so expressive without words. That's where the love master came from. Yes, right the there. love master is so deep within me. It's deep within all of us. But white people cover it all up because mm -hmm. they have dads like your dad. Yeah. Because you, oh, yeah. you don't speak of your emotions. No, and you're talking about a culture true. that does speak from their emotions but and yeah. should and their pain and the suffering. You probably got a lot of love from her and it's good she was in your life. She she loved me more than anyone, yeah. more than any adult. That's mm, cool. My white grandson. Mm. <laughs> That's what she called me, her white grandson. But people don't understand, like, they make assumptions when you and I talk about Black Lives Matter or anything <laughs> like that. They make all these assumptions because they're not dealing with their own resentments and their own anger that's been hidden for their entire lives. Mm -hmm. But you and I, right, you broke free from that. You, we were raised to. with racism. Yeah. You know, my yeah. grandmother, you know, used the N-word and, yeah. and you know, obviously they used things because they didn't know any better. Like your father, colored. Yeah. You know, no, that's what it was. Yeah. And, and I, uh, I, 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 I want to be really careful about calling them full on flagrant racists. I call it low grade racism, but I call it racism by elimination racism because of lack of exposure. Yes. The reason why they were racist is because it was the unknown to them. They didn't have any black friends. They didn't have any black coworkers. Yeah. So they just figured because they're over there and I don't know them, they must be bad. You know, well, I think Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yeah, they, boom. They, there they, it is. Right they there. know not what they do because it's all they know is what they know mm -hmm. is what's in front of us. Yeah. This goes for everyone, period. Mm -hmm. You only know what's in front of you. But I think that what, Hopefully what Black Lives Matter does is it does, it just kicks some people into another gear where you suddenly you go, hey, maybe I shouldn't be racist. Maybe I should listen yeah. and not just come back with all lives matter. Maybe I should just pause for a moment, yeah. a sacred pause for your own freedom. Because yeah. you're in prison if you're, 
If you see people like that, you're in your own prison, right? I mean, if, if, good if way you, to put it. If you, yeah, you, you, you got the keys though to to get out. Yeah. It, it, it's your own anger prison it, it, resentments and these, uh, you know, these this misplaced rage that goes on to other cultures. It doesn't need to be there. You can live happy and free if you free yourself. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I think you've done that. It's, you know, I've been admiring you from afar and. You know, I think you with me as well, you know, but, but when I saw that, you just kicked into another gear for me. I appreciate that, my friend. It it, it really, you know, what, what, how can people find it by the way? It's on, uh, Fritz Coleman comedian, my YouTube channel. And the full presentation is 33 minutes long, but it's broken up into 10 chapters and you can listen to the one about music. You can listen to the one about the repeat uh, behavior in race riots from the forties to the you know, current time. It's a bit of a history lesson, which is, is wonderful. It is, and it's just my opinion. I don't pretend to know everything about everything. It's not it's your opinion. Perception. No, no, you're sharing facts. Yeah. No, let's get it straight. Well, when you talk about something in history, yeah, a gamble and huff, that's a fact All that, yeah. that they existed. It's yeah. a fact that you responded to their music. That's a mm-hmm. fact. Yeah. See, that's the no. thing that, you know, this is what I'm trying to tell people is like, if you share your experience, that's a fact. Yeah. Right. It's not an opinion. That doesn't subject you to cancel culture. If exactly. Fact. That's yeah. what I'm yeah. saying. You I can't, gotcha. you yeah. can't cancel you for your experience. Yeah. No. And if you've had discoveries, that's even better because you can share those discoveries with people. And, and brilliant comedians like yourself are successful because they are able to put into words common experience. It's your reality, too. You just don't have the gift of being able to express it as funny, as ironically, or as... Uh, as interestingly as performers do. Do you think that uh, people can be coached into being performers or being a comedian? Do you think they can? That's a really good question. I know you've done it on a TV show or two. I don't know if you can or not. People say, well, why are you funny? Say, I have no idea. My father was funny. He was a great dry wit. And the reverse of that, my mother was the world's best audience. She would laugh hard. So I had... Uh, the heredity of him and the audience of her and it all just, you know, I just like performing. We talked about that before the show until I nailed you with the SIFTA line. <laughs> I have to tell I use this word SIFTA, save it for the air. I, I Sometimes I don't even speak to people, but you I had to. I mean, we just jumped right into it. Yeah. I hadn't seen each other in a while. But uh, I was talking about, you know, about how laughter is so important in a relationship. And I'm going to give a tip to the ladies right now. From the love master, baby. <laughs> you got to laugh <laughs> at your man. You laugh at your man. That's an aphrodisiac. That's a turn on. Right. Right? And women, if you can loosen up and have some laughs with him, at him, whatever it is, we just care about the laughter. Yeah. I announced to my wife the other day, I have a mistress, a laughter mistress. <laughs> <laughs> I told her, Caroline Ray, I make her pee from laughing, and it makes me feel so good, especially someone I respect like her. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. We laugh. I got home late the other night. I go, honey, I, I'm sorry. I've been out with my mistress. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about getting my it jokes anymore. It takes the pressure off her. That's great. Yeah. That, that's just, great. yeah. And then, she, and then, and then we, we had sex because she was turned on by how happy I was. I'm very happy making people laugh. Aren't you? Well, it's obvious. I mean, you're, you're, nobody's better than you. No, I mean, no, I mean, no, I mean, don't you get a real thrill? Oh, no, yeah, even if it's one on one, even I if I, you made me laugh a couple times today, right? And it's, it's got to make you feel good. It's the, um, it's the quest for that that keeps us going back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my quest is not as strong as it was for stages to do that. I really get a kick out of one on one laughs. I think they're the That's most more connected. Honest. Yeah. 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 It's the most honest you can get. Yeah. Because who knows what the psychology of, and it might be for you, it might've been your lack of a father to me. It might've been the only way I was ever to please my dad was to be funny around. Yeah, him. sure. Uh, it, 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 it the, our desire, this sort of uh, psychosis of having to go out into a dark room with a hundred strangers and make them happy to please them, to try to get their approval. People that will in no way affect your life after this evening That's is over. Right. Why is that so important That's to us? Yeah. But I, uh, and there's a, and I'm not Freud, but I, there, there are reasons, you know, for you, it might've been your lack of a father looking for male approval for me it was oh, mom too yeah mom too uh, more so my mom oh, actually to tell you the truth i wanted my mom's approval yeah. and that's another reason i'm happy these days is i don't care about that anymore good that's not on the that's list really a healthy as a matter of fact we have the best relationship we've ever had because of that i let go of that and i also ended up appreciating her for all of her humor I mean, she really is funny like this is one funny woman i cannot wow. stop laughing but we have that now 
as opposed to what we had before. Did you ever come from with your family? I know it's a, you know, it's a white family as you were describing. Ooh. We all know what that means. Yeah. So uh, was there any disconnect like uh, years of not speaking? Did they, did they ever do the, I, I, I will say, the, I won't speak to you thing. Has anybody I, done I that? I will say this about that. I, I and, and again, it sounds like an exaggeration, but it's not. I don't think either of my parents enjoyed being parents. I think it was that classic, the to-do list after World War II. Obligations. We'll, we'll get married. We'll have a kid. We'll right. have to have a kid. Maybe two kids. We'll have one kid. But medically, my mom couldn't have two. I think she did it because it was expected of American uh, women in the 50s sure. and 60s. I don't think she enjoyed a day of it. I don't think my father didn't have the patience for it. Honest wow. to God, I know it sounds absurd, yeah. but it's true. And I think my desire to please them, and I knew I could get my mom to laugh, and I knew my father respected humor. That was one way I could connect with them, which is why I find myself on stage now. Yeah. Anyway. It's funny. And they're both passed away, right? Yes. And it's funny how it still carries with you. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. amazing. No. Both my parents are alive. and uh, Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, well, you're a dad. Tell me if you had this experience. I I... I wanted to be a father, which is why I quit drinking uh, two months before I got married because I thought drinking could be my Achilles heel here. If I, if I don't get this in check, my father was an alcoholic. He was asleep at 6 o'clock every night because he drank himself to sleep. Wow. And, and that's part of the reason why I didn't relate to him very much. And I thought that could be my one, you know, it was hereditary, and uh, that could be my one Achilles heel. So I stopped. And so then I had kids, and it was the most joyful experience. My children gave me a soul. It taught more in a very narcissistic business, the performance. It's all about us, me, 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 me. Oh, it's the it, opposite. Right, right. And, yeah. it, and it taught me to uh, reverse that and, and be responsible for somebody else's welfare. Yeah. It made me a human being. And I was so happy when I became a parent. And then I began to resent my father in retrospect, saying, how could this man, how could either of these people not really enjoy this, be, be fulfilled by this amazing experience? Sure. So I resented them for about 20 years. Now I've gone back to, you know what? You have to look at their backstory and, and their flaws and just forgive them. And practice empathy. And practice empathy. Exactly. And just, be on their side. That's what switched it with my mom. I mean, I just got into a place of, uh, I had the, well, you did a, what, you, what mother would do this, yeah, you know, all yeah, those things. Yeah. And, well, and that's I, what it was for you me. You justify, you know, justify your actions of not speaking to or, or sharing yeah. resentments or whatever it is yeah. until one day, it was literally one day it switched. Now it's like, it'll that's, never, that's it'll never go back because of that amount of full acceptance of what you're saying is that's really I accept her exactly for who she is i don't expect anything else there's no unreasonable expectations and i believe this about every relationship that we have we should we should practice this like people without children you can practice this with your friends you can practice this with your compadre your partner whoever it is is that same amount of empathy look at your partner like that and watch how you can grow and evolve. It's amazing when you can and experience it, it that. It lightens your burden, so much of our emotional burden. It does. It does. Being in judgment. But there's no one out teaching this. That's a good I've got a point. podcast with 12 people. Right, I know. <laughs> 12 people tell me. No, you can't look at how many people are listening. <laughs> no, no. If you're connecting with one, that's what. That's where I am lately. It's like, good. I don't need the big crowds, although money comes with big crowds, you know, because they pay the cover charge. <laughs> But, but, you know, you got to make a living. But about what you said and having empathy, but what taught me to have empathy too was I got to a point where I looked at the history of my family. Why was my dad so emotionally shut down? Well, as it turns out, he was closer to my mother than he was to my father, or to, to his father. His father was an alcoholic, worse than he was. Mm. It was. It's all the males on his side of the family were alcoholics back many generations. Wow. And, and... His, you're like you're like Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump. All all, all the generations oh, oh, of I know of, of, oh, I forgot of about soldiers. Yeah. <laughs> you're all the generations of alcoholics. No, it I'm was. like picturing all the all the Coleman's no. throughout the, I broke throughout the, the years. I said I might not and you understand this, I might not be the perfect parent, but what I was was a sober parent. I gave yeah. my my parent, my children a conscious father and yeah. I didn't have the benefit of that. So no matter what happens, if they screw their lives up, it wasn't because I was a drinker. It makes parenting easier, actually. We just think, you just think it really does. Yes. If you have the consciousness to say, 
I'm going to give them everything that I longed for. Yes. So if I long to be heard, if I long to be hugged, if I long to be told I love you, that's what I give them. It makes parenting simple. You can make easy decisions that way because that, the decision is founded in love and light and laughter. That's so a good if, way to if describe that's, it. If that's what it is, then, then it makes – I don't have to go to a book, you know. <laughs> It only took me 50 years to learn that lesson, and you gave it to me in one podcast. (laughs) Thank you very much for that information. Now, I was getting to this. uh, My hidden resentment with you is (laughs) you became what I wanted to become, a weatherman. I wrote it down in my damn yearbook. Not once did you ever say to me, you know, I've always wanted to do this. Could I just come in and fake my way through a forecast, which is exactly what I do every day? (laughs) I wish Why that I would tell me I should have expressed this 30 you years ago when we met. Piece, played the toy, play with the toys. And I've stuff. done that. I'm oh, talking okay. about, I wanted your job. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, when you go on the road, don't you go to these small and medium markets? Yeah. And, and they let and me they do, let the do the weather. Yeah, they, they do. They let me do the weather. And I have, a, and that's the reason why I was never hired to do the weather. Cause I'm goofing <laughs> off. Cause I learned from Jim O'Brien. Who oh I did my, my I did my term paper on Jim O'Brien wow. did and you action news. Did you interview him? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, that guy was my idol, and he was a weatherman. I yeah. mean, obviously he did radio, and yeah. and I he wanted did, to be him. He did 9 to noon on WFIL radio, and then went over and did the uh, newscast. That's right, on Channel 6, which has been number one since then in the 70s. No, I know it. That I they, Action they, News. They invented the Eyewitness News or Action News. Action format. News. Uh, twenty. It's like 20 stories in 22 minutes. I mean, they have yeah. a formula they follow. Yeah. And it's what's his name uh, that, that was the anchor during that period of time? Jim Jim Gardner. Jim Gardner and the other and Larry guy. Kane. Larry Kane was the guy that would look at you like with these hypnotic eyes. Through Larry the Kane left that. What he are, left that news to, to, because he got like arrogant. He thought it was about him. That was what my paper was on. Wow. You, when you have a format like that, that's what wins. Oh, the format wins, right. Because you can just keep replacing people, all mm-hmm. the pieces, because all through the years, they're still it number Larry one. Larry Kane the and Jim Gardner. And Jim Gardner, is he still in the air? He might be back there. Right? Oh, yeah, he's still in the air. I and it's kind of like football. Like Bill Walsh came up with a system. They, he, he stepped aside. Seifert came in, won the Super Bowl. It's yeah. the same sort, same sort yeah, of thing. It's yeah. the system. Yeah. If you can develop a system that's organic and real and good and sustainable, there, there's yeah. where the secret is. I mean, yeah. then he was replaced by Dave Roberts. Yeah. Who, uh, it was my first television show was with Dave Roberts on AM Philadelphia. Yeah. And I imitated Jim Gardner on the show. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I did this uh, this thing about, uh, actually it's something, did you ever do one of those broadcasting, uh, uh, not, not seminars, but uh, like a course in broadcasting? Oh yeah, the American Academy of Broadcasting. That, yes. I Don't. taught at that. I taught, I taught. I, 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 was, I would. I would poop a chicken right now if you were my teacher. I <laughs> no, would, no, no, no. How do you know I wasn't? No. I, I do know one of the teachers, Dick Hungate. I remember him from WMMR. Yeah. But, yeah, they brought in, like, DJs. Yeah, yeah that's all. I, I only did it, like, four times. And the other guy that did it How do it you was know the, you weren't my teacher? No, I'm sure I would. Why I, are you sure? Because you would have known. No, I wouldn't have known. You I, would say, I, this guy is patently unqualified <laughs> to be a teacher down here. I remember it was like, you know, I used to talk like this. I couldn't get a date on a calendar. I was lonesome and insecure. <laughs> and now I talk like this because I went to the American Academy of Broadcasting. That's how they taught you to yeah. talk. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> you were one of the teachers. Yeah, Our like lives that. have crossed a thousand times. I know. And yet, uh, you know, I don't but even know where you live. You, so you and I. You're not were, a lot older than me. When uh, I went to, I went to Temple from 72 to 74. It's not a lot older. Come on, it, no, it's a, it's it. a scooch. It's a scooch older, but you know, it's not like it's not like you're some wise old man that I. But I'll know. tell you, I, I was in the Navy for four years, and I worked for Armed Forces Television and Radio. Yeah, I made a tape for myself, and I got hired at Wi-Fi, which was across City Line Avenue from Channel Six in the big round yeah. building. Yeah, we were in the Saks Fifth Avenue parking lot right there. Right. I was out of work for zero days the day after i got out of the navy i started at wi-fi and i worked there for four years did you do that voice yes i did all the no it was all no, did it, you really seriously it was the uh it was it, it was a big high energy top 40 station 
My name is Bobby Walker. On the, they wouldn't let me call myself Fritz because I sound like a Nazi camp guard. They said, they said no, we want you to change your name to Bobby Walker. The, oh, my God. And, and, and then Fritz the Cat came out. That was a triple X, first triple yeah. X animated it's cartoon. Right? Yeah. But listen to this. As a Philly person, you will, uh, you will envy me for this. Uh, when I first started there, I did overnights. I did midnight to six. And the morning host for about six months was High Lit. Do you remember High Lit? W I B G. He was a big Wibbage DJ. And, I, and he was. He wasn't, was he the boss with the hot sauce? <laughs> no, that, who was that? Oh, that was Jerry Blavitt. Oh, he's the, the boss. The Geeter with the Heater, the boss with the hot sauce. He's the Geeter with the Heater. Yeah. I thought maybe High Lit was the boss with the hot sauce, but, <laughs> no. but it turns out the Geeter with the Heater Lit has both. High Lit went on to become the announcer for the Harlem Globetrotters. I did not know that. That's how he I ended I thought I career. knew everything. <laughs> What's your, what would you say is your best moment on stage that you experienced on stage? Do you have one? Like a moment where you just went, man, I'm in the pocket. I'm doing what I want to do. This is what I love. Opening for Ray Charles at the Universal Amphitheater. God, another thing we have in common. This is making me yeah, sick. Yeah. His audiences are great. He, he were, but he was not, he was, he was a very difficult human being. Did you ever try to relate to him in any way? Oh, that's so weird. That's not my experience. My experience was this. Uh, I was with the William Morris Agency. So you, would you like to open for Ray Charles? Right. Universal was a great a theater. Yeah. I love that amphitheater. I said, I will do it for free. If I can just get my picture taken with Ray Charles to put in the <laughs> really? end of my house. They said, well, we'll get you a picture. So he said, I've arranged it. It's all set right after the show. When he's done his set, you go backstage and get your picture taken. So I did my performance. And, you know, you feel like you're at the pinnacle of show business when you're opening for Ray and Charles. And you're killing, right? Yeah. Oh, it was, it was, it was, you know, it's killing within the opening act framework, which is people sure. are coming in, but you can kill whoever's in their seats by that yeah. time. Yeah. So uh, I'm waiting backstage, and I'm waiting by the elephant doors because he's not going to get out of there without me, without, <laughs> without me getting my picture taken. So he finishes his show. He doesn't do any encores. You know, he plays Georgia and leaves the stage. Yeah. People are on their feet clapping hysterically. The, uh, the elephant doors open. Eight of the biggest, like, redwood tree-sized black guys open these doors and escort him to his car, which is already running outside. And Alice said, but wait, I'm supposed to get my picture taken, no. Mr. Charles. And the guy went, the, the, one of his handlers said, Mr. Charles ain't getting his picture taken with nobody. Into the car. He's in Malibu before the applause stops. Wow. And so I got blown off. Never got a picture with him. I had the exact bitch. opposite experience. Oh, no. Well, you're, you're bigger. It I was so right. strange. I mean, yeah, he shook my hand, and he did it like they did in the oh, movie. Oh, I never met the guy. He, 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 he shook my hand, and he grabbed my wrist like he did in the movie. I'm going, you're not getting this, buddy. Because <laughs> he used to check women out by their wrists. You yeah. know that, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, so, and then, he, and then he, he felt my whole body down my legs and stuff. He goes, you're a strapping young man. Wow. And, you know, it was so interesting. And, and, but I did find his show was not that good. It was it was just a mail in type of thing. No, he wasn't mail in and, this. And the way they good. dressed him, I used to think, but God, thank God you're blind. <laughs> if you could see how they put the ruffles they put you in, <laughs> I, looks like I, my prom outfit. I used to talk to the Tonight Show orchestra, Doc Severinsen's orchestra, because sure. I worked right upstairs from there. Right, and I was upstairs, and I would always say, "What was the most horrifying experience?" He said, "Every time Ray Charles came." into the studio it was traumatizing because he was such a perfectionist yeah you know part of it you know, being blind is it heightens your other sensitivities mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. he knew if yeah. somebody was an eighth note off right. in their pitch he'd stop the thing and he'd fine him 50 bucks for being an eighth note off he said we hate it when oh, ray charles would come that in. is interesting anyway now, I, I, ever, I never dealt were, with him were you ever on the tonight show the johnny carson eight tonight times show? yeah oh my uh, god my jealousy just increased even no, tenfold no. i was on or no johnny? eightfold it just increased eight you're on eight Times. I was on with Johnny, uh, Joan Rivers, Jay Leno, and Gary Shandling. Oh, my, you've got to yeah. be kidding no. me. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Now, see, you, you have all this praise for me. I mean, I, I'm dying over here. First of all, you, ha you took no. my career. No. First in radio, on, I wanted to be on WFIL or Wi-Fi or one, one of those. Then you became a weatherman, which I wrote in my yearbook, and I never became, never did it once. You are so overqualified to be a weatherman. No, I'm ridiculous. overqualified. Yes, it's perfect for me. You get to go to work every day you know, you do the and same, get paid. You, for, for 40 years, I said morning clouds and fog hazy <laughs> afternoon sun. What was the question? Yeah. Oh, that's I have yeah. a bit about that. I was that. Vanna White with maps <laughs> for 40 years. <laughs> it was 
I actually do a bit about that when I go to certain areas. I said, you know, I said, I'd love to be the weatherman in Miami in the summer. Hot and humid, chance of showers. Back to you, Bob. <laughs> Thanks, Nostradamus. <laughs> Because that's basically what... Exactly. That's what... That's yeah, what, what, certain areas. No, no, your job as a weatherman is to think up new, exciting ways to say the same thing every day. Wow. Yeah. And I always said that my job in the, in the newscast was to be a palate cleanser between the tragedy and the sports. That was my whole job. Were you ever intimidated by doing The Tonight Show? There's Johnny Carson. Yes, your first it time. was always gut And I got bumped twice before I finally got on. Did he ever call you over? No, he never called. You know, that's what you wanted. I never I never killed on The Tonight Show. I had good performances, but I never. You must have done well. You were asked back. I, I, I was never I, asked the first time. I was I was never killed. And I know. That doesn't have the, now it means nothing. I mean, well, it does to people like me. Old people, no, like you, you know, and me. No, no, no. <laughs> the, the Carson show, I mean, David yeah, Brenner was, tells the great story about- I was on Carson Daly. That's about, <laughs> that's my that's my credit. I, was, I did Carson. Carson <laughs> Daly, I leave that part out. Wow, but that's- those, days, those were career changers. You know, one career good shot. Changers. And David Brenner talked about how, yeah. you know, his he went from a $500 a show to $15,000 a show. Amazing, after one, yes. Show oh, my God. Man, I could talk to you all day. Why don't we do that? Why don't we just have lunch <laughs> let's, without a microphone? <laughs> okay, let's do it. Anytime. Let's do that. i got to wrap it up now. But what's your social media? How do we, Fritz Coleman- Yes. Funny I, I, man or from yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the it, Twitter's the real Fritz Coleman. So is uh, Instagram on, uh, you can find me on Facebook. And if you want to w- listen to the race thing that Craig was nice enough to mention, just go to Fritz Coleman Comedian, my YouTube channel, and I would love to have you watch it. Man, I don't know even how you got the, you must have such power <laughs> that they, the rules do not apply to you when you're coming up with your, 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 your name on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That's a lot of letters. Well, That's a lot of letters. That. How they, did they just let you do that? <laughs> I don't know. I've got a social media person that handles it. You do? I, I've never met the woman, but <laughs> so far, everything's going really well. That's hilarious. I have the same thing. Mine are in Mexico. I'm like, I don't even get my jokes. Oh, my God. Anyway, Fritz, it was a real blast having you here. Uh, so, uh, listen, this goes to everyone out there. Uh, I'm sure you had a great time today, as I did, and uh, hopefully, you know, you got a little something out of it. That's all. That's all. I, you know, and I know there's not many of you. <laughs> so I said that earlier, or there might be many of you. That doesn't matter. It just matters if if we connect, and we need to connect as one. It's humanity. It's it's. Somebody said the other day, "What's wrong with humanity?" I said, "Humans. That's the, that's what's wrong with humanity because we are acting like idiots." So let's get smart. And one of the smart moves you can make is is download this podcast, but also just have more laughter and light in your life and levity. That's what we want, okay? So uh, spread the word, and I hope you have a great day. And just remember, I I say this every week. You know you have to have a sign-off. Well, here's mine, Fritz. I could have done this on the weather. Lighten the fuck up, will you, folks? (laughs) We'll see you next time.